Founding Story episode. Episode two of the podcast, and we figured that if you guys are going to keep up with where we are now and where we're headed, you need to understand how it all started, how we all assembled into this monkey kingdom, and it really all started back when I was in college. Um, I've been an athlete my whole life and always been super mindful about food and exercise, but. In my earlier years, when I was born and raised in Hong Kong, um, I could only be as mindful based on like how much I knew. And the landscape in Hong Kong is not so health conscious. And um, I didn't realize that my whole upbringing, I was eating stuff that I was allergic to and that I had gut issues. And I'll go into that in another, in another spider web tangent later. But then finally, I moved to the States. Um, I was at Boston University, and it was when I was on their rowing team that a coach suggested I get an allergy test because I wasn't responding to the training the way other people were and I was so tired, I just felt so off given, uh, despite the fact that I was doing all these things right. And that's when I realized I had celiac disease, I was lactose intolerant, and um, so I just went cold turkey and I cut it out of my diet, but I started missing so many of the things that I usually ate. And um, I have a sweet tooth as well. But being so mindful of like my macronutrients, a lot of sweets and indulgences like just don't work with that plan. Um, and so I just started whipping up like healthy desserts in my dorm room. And the first variations were like chia pudding that in hindsight was pretty awful, but I ate a lot of it. Um, and then it evolved into like healthier, like these random like pancake like things that were chokeable. Um, and then finally landed on reinventing ice cream and the early batches were just made on a food processor that I bought the Bed Bath Beyond on BU campus and um, started whipping up superfoods fruits and seeds it was so damn good um, to the point where when I was calculating the macros I just like couldn't believe how delicious functional nutritious it was and my teammates couldn't believe it my friends couldn't believe it um, Liza who's now our CMO couldn't believe it she would come over and pretty much eat Tupperwares of it. Um, yeah, it was a ghetto. It was their Tupperwares with saran wrap and rubber bands. And that's when Liza was like, all right, I've got to help you market this thing. And so Liza, like, walked into the picture. And, um... Hey, guys. I'm Liza. <laughs> <laughs> Liza. Yeah, I'm Liza. I'm now the CMO. At the time, <laughs> at the time just the stealer, or, the, or I guess the snow monkey thief. Yeah. Um... But it was really in that kind of window of time right before I graduated um, and I was looking at like real estate jobs, finance jobs, thinking if I was moving back to Hong Kong or not. But getting all this validation from friends, from teammates and also myself, like anytime I went to the supermarket to try and find an equivalent of like Snow Monkey that we were making at home, there was just nothing. And then it like dawned upon me that like America's in this unhealthy relationship with dessert. It's something like families love. They go out and like celebrate over ice cream. It's everyone's like guilty pleasure. But the problem there is that guilt word. Like why can't it just be pure pleasure? Like the foods we love should be able to love us back, especially when it has such negative consequences. Like when it comes to health, um, brain fog. I mean, look, food allergies are so are so tied to our mental and physical performance and I just like never looked back we were like compelled to bring this to market um using ice cream as a vehicle to spark change so we started booking meeting rooms at the business school and <laughs> we also did that in like the most hysterical way possible we like would find because I wasn't in the business school I was in the communications college and Rachel you were getting a minor in SMG yeah. and that's what BU called the business school and so you could only book rooms for like 30 or 45 minutes at a time, but only people in the school actually had access to that booking system. So we'd like try to find all the people that we knew in SMG and be like, yo, can you just like book this same room for like create like three hour blocks of all these random people that had absolutely no intention of ever going into that room. But yeah, but 
It worked. We actually had like weekly meetings with like updates and we took it so seriously given we had other things going on. Uh, mm -hmm. There were actual other projects for school that we were working on. Um, but that looking back, it like really speaks to like how genuinely passionate we were about it. Uh, and we had no clue it was going to grow into this. Like, we had no idea what we were getting no into. Clue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like 2015, I graduated, stayed on campus. Liza was class of 2016, so she was still there. And um, got some funding from BU to actually like keep rolling it through the summer. And by the end of that summer, we had so much proof of concept. We're like, all right, we're going to bring this to market. So we launched a Kickstarter, which was in February of 2016. So we spent like the last half of 2015 really perfecting the formula, the branding. We started working with a branding studio and design um, design firm to bring like Snow Monkey as a brand to yeah. life. To really like figure out our positioning in the market, get all of these things that, because Snow Monkey started from personal use. It was yeah. just, you know, a personal need. And so they kind of helped us kind of funnel that that need that we had and make it more relatable to the mass market i think a lot of people also had that need but you know when sometimes when you have a need yourself it's hard to then communicate why everyone else might need that same thing so they really helped us with that um and coming up with like beautiful packaging to yeah. make it attractive which you know we've obviously changed since then but at the time we had so much fun doing it i I still have all of those like renderings and stuff on my computer. We need to make an evolution wall of literally like Definitely. the monkey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I remember, so Rachel came to me with like the first, because you found some random person in Starbucks that did like watercolors to yeah. make the logos. And so she, she's like, oh my God, look at this logo and shows it to me and it's all watercolored and beautiful. I'm like, wow, that's gorgeous. But I hate to break it to you, like that is going to be the most expensive logo ever to print on every marketing material because you have a gradient. So it's so many colors and you get charged by the color when you're printing a lot of the time. So it's just like, that's kind of why most brands stick to like two, maybe three colors um, for their logo. A lot of times just one. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, we're gonna have to work this. So the branding agency really helped us kind of refine that. But the and first logo is cool. Also, like, our thought process, like, it's kind of unusual for a business in their first year to spend, like, 50% of their costs on branding. Mm -hmm. But we know that, like, perception and aesthetics really matters. And we were like, you know what? If we're going to make an entrance, let's go out in our best suit. Because so many brands will, like, first launch in, like, a quasi, like, Ziploc bag with, like, a sticker that mom wrote on. And it's like, okay, that looks janky as fuck. I'm not going to eat that, right? And then you, like, see these, like, evolution of things, and we're like, okay, let's yeah. just get it right. Yeah, no one wanted to buy it out of your Tupperware. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, um, Ziploc. While we're talking um, about branding really quick, a common, na or a common question is how did the name come up? How did you land on that? Yeah, um, it was not called Snow Monkey during any of the working meetings we had ex until, like, the very end, but um, it was because Snow Monkey's banana-based, it's super primal, um, and we thought, okay, this is like a fun play on things. But beyond that, it was like super reflective of our founding journey where we literally went and wildly foraged for all these ingredients that Google had foods. Google foods. Yeah. Whole foods. Oh, I'm I mean, Google, Google foods, foods also <laughs> help. Google food. I don't know if Amazon would like that, but oh. well, <laughs> Jeff, you didn't help that much at the beginning. Um, but <laughs> I hope he never listens to it. If Jeff listens, actually, I dream. really hope Jeff, he listens. I'm not sorry we this. said that. Okay, um, <laughs> we ship a lot through you guys. Um, we're not on Amazon. We're not on Amazon. We should be though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but what was I saying? Oh yeah, so it was super reflective of the way we were like, all right, we're gonna wildly forage for all these superfood ingredients, things that are uncommonly used, but like we're gonna put it in there and make the best ice cream alternative ever and bring it back to our tribe as fuel. So we had that down. We launched the Kickstarter in February 2016. You moved to LA before Kickstarter launches. Yes, I moved to LA yeah. because- I stayed in Boston, got to finish school. Yeah, apparently that was important. Stay in school, kids, unless you're founding Facebook, then definitely leave. <laughs> Maybe stay in school, then found Facebook. They all in left case. school. Yeah. I mean, do whatever you got to do, I guess, but um, I stayed in school. Yeah, moved to L.A. because selfishly, like, hello, it's beautiful. Um, not that anyone's looking at it, but um, because it's really important to live the lifestyle that 
brings us alive and also live the lifestyle that our consumers live and be really close to our core consumer. And that is SoCal through and through. So I moved to LA, um, but then did go back to Boston for the launch party, the Kickstarter, which is really important to be back in that origin. Yeah, and we sure. actually had an event in the SMG business school lobby for our Kickstarter launch. And we had the Kickstarter Whoa. campaign like playing, people came by, people were like donating. We were 100% funded in four days. We were 180% funded overall. It was incredible. Um, but then we had to figure out how to send Snow Monkey to 42 different states. We didn't think that part through. We were so fixated on the launch um, that then we had to figure out how to get it to everyone. So we managed to get that done. And then we um, leveraged the data that we had from Kickstarter to go around to all these little like mom and pops around LA and we were like, Look, we launched this alternative ice cream on Kickstarter. People paid more than full price for it, which is unusual for like online crowdfunding. And look at all these like customers that are in this zip code that paid for it. If we just send them an email and say, hey, it's now available at like X store, they're going to come like right down the road. Like that's a conversion right there. And um, after enough like begging and sweet talking and just showing up unannounced and pretty much like begging for shelf space, we got it on there. And then Whole Foods was like, okay. Also quickly for everyone's knowledge, when Snow Monkey launched on the Kickstarter and like this whole time, it was goji berry and cacao were the flavors and they were in eight ounce pots. Now we sell in those 16 ounce um, pints that you like normally see every kind of ice cream in. But we thought we were being super cool and innovative by doing these like eight ounce pods, which it is great to be cool and innovative, but there's some things that like are just easier not to really change. And one of those things is packaging, simply because you have to go fill it in a co-packer and nobody has that equipment. Yeah. That was kind of a nightmare. Yeah, and also the shelves aren't configured for eight ounce pods that look like hair gel like yeah. in hindsight. Congrats to Talenti, they figured it out. But other than that, like no one's really changed. Like there's only a couple ways that you package yeah. ice cream. I mean even Talenti's pods though are the same size as Pints. That's true, that's true. Yeah. Whereas ours were totally different. So buyers also were like, oh, screw this. They fall, they slide, like... Yeah. Um, but yeah. anyways, I digress. Then Whole Foods. Then Whole Foods was like, all right, we want to take you into like our top local stores. And then came that snowball effect. And all of a sudden, within our first year of business, we ended it with 250 stores. And we were like, all right, we need to really support this thing. We have a community. We have a big like social a big social following and we're trying to grow that socials everything and so reached out to a dear friend who that I, I used to work with in a different regard named Ruby and um, asked Ruby if she would help us do our Instagram part-time and so in comes Ruby hello and Ruby was still in Boston and she had to basically take Instagram photos from Boston's climate that looked like we were in LA, which was probably like a whole course on itself. Yeah, it was interesting. It was like full on blizzard. Rachel reached out to me, I think in November. She was like, we're about to get on retail shelves. Um, and I just need, I don't have time to focus on Instagram. Do you have some time in your week to just help me take Instagram photos? And I was like, yeah, I love Instagram. It's fine. Um, and then blizzard season hit in Boston and it, we're a Southern California brand. So trying to find like the perfect time of day to take sunny photos in the middle of a blizzard was a challenge in and of itself but it was fun and um yeah yeah um and it just like skyrocketed from there because then look basically 2017 comes around and um so i'm back on the team full time oh, at this yeah. point okay so, so we're gonna do a quick oh, like pulse check go. on the timeline so November 2016, Ruby takes over Instagram. Ruby is working at a different company, her corporate job. Um, corporate job. Boo. And, um, <laughs> They're great. They're great. great company, but boo, corporate job. Um, and then I'm also, I'm, so I'm in college. Yeah, yeah, I'm still, I guess, studying. Probably not, but something. Yeah. And um, so then Rachel's working on Kickstarter, doing all that fun stuff. Then Rachel... We're in 2017, the beginning. Rachel gets Erwan, Whole Foods. Then it's springtime. Did I totally mess this up? Oh, yeah, no, I wasn't studying. I had a job, too. No, yeah, you I had tend, a Yeah, job. I was at a corporate job because I graduated. Um, yeah, also, 
boo. Like, so <laughs> Liza and I were still in Boston. Liza and I were in Boston. Rachel was the only one that was in LA already. Um, yeah. So I was working at a, I was interning at a PR firm doing CPG PR. That was, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but Liza did get really, really I awesome did, skills did. and experience because she was working on a food brand. So she could leverage all that knowledge and apply it to food brand and a grocery store. She definitely had the most appropriate internship ever for this. And she was there for a year and then she was like, deuces. Not even, not even. I like like, peaced out so quick. Oh yeah. She, yeah, I wasn't even there. Third trimester she was out. Um, (laughs) (laughs) preemie. Yeah. (laughs) So what's the joke you're going for? Um, okay. So anyways, then comes spring 2017. I joined the team again, full time, moved to LA and meet Ruby in Boston. We like Loki got drunk together, (laughs) fell in love. Um, and then Ruby. Then I, Rachel convinced me to move across the country. Um, I was still working my corporate job and she was like, come on, you've always wanted to live in LA, just come to LA. Like, there, at this point, there was still no job offer on the table. I wasn't gonna leave my corporate job to come work for Snow Monkey. I was very comfortable and safe in my corporate job, but I was like, all right, I'll move to LA, keeping my corporate job. And you worked from home, so they would let you live right Yeah, now. exactly, I was working from home, so it was like a perfect situation. Yeah, who doesn't, like, I'm tired of snow, Rachel's right, LA's beautiful, I'm closer to home, all that stuff. So I land in LA, and like two days later, Rachel's like, hey, can we go to coffee? And I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Like she wants to welcome me to LA. Like, yeah, let's go to coffee. (laughs) (laughs) She shows up, we actually get smoothies instead of coffee. And she shows up and on the back of a napkin, kid you not, on the back of a napkin, she slides the napkin over to me and it's a job offer. (laughs) And she's like, so are we doing this or? Like literal job terms and numbers on this napkin. On a napkin. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta think about it, but like, yeah, let's do it. She also asked me if she can take the napkin. Yeah. Yeah, I took the napkin with me. Most people want their job offer to like go home and look at it. (laughs) (laughs) Take a photo, bro. 21st century. I took the napkin with me. I probably could find the napkin if I really wanted to. Should go in the museum. Yeah, so she quickly convinced me to leave my corporate job, come over to Snow Monkey full time, um, and that was two years ago. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm I'm no longer doing social media. Oh we, yeah, there are also two dogs. The dogs are here. We have uh, They've arrived. Awesome people who run social media, and I now act as our chief of staff. Yeah. So that so napkin offer was like August 2017. Yeah. And then you officially joined the team like October. October one, let's say. Yeah. yeah. 2017. And then in that brief time span, we got accepted to Chovani Food Incubator, which yes. was probably like one of the biggest moments. I mean, there have been so many big moments, but I think we can all agree that being in that incubator was kind of fundamental to like where we are now. Um, it was. Oh, I mean. Insane. The amount of knowledge that was so openly shared with Chobani and also the fact that Hamdi, the CEO of Chobani, really wanted nothing in return other than to enable and help the young companies take on like big food conglomerates the way like Chobani had with Big Yogurt was absolutely incredible. So we ended 2017 on an incredible high. All of us flying to New York once a month from LA, like taking the red eye, going straight to the offices in Soho. Um, and it was also at Chobani where we met Mel, who was at the time doing marketing and also was their chef and whipping up a lot of great smelling stuff that we walked by pretty much every day. So Mel was at Chobani. Now she's not, obviously. <laughs> Showing the couch Ta-da. now. Yeah. yeah. A lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of late nights at the Chobani office and trying to constantly feed these guys and Rachel constantly going dude I have allergies and I'm just like can you just write like write them down for me I'll figure it out I can make something (laughs) (laughs) so we got really close to Mel during that time I think also for me that's kind of where I realized like I think that was my first moment where I was like oh shit we started a company like yeah Yeah. (laughs) there's kind of no turning back at this point like doing this yeah like this is this is real uh, I don't know if that was like kind of maybe you had that moment before, but 
No, I think I. I think that was my first like, really like I knew it yeah. before, but that was my first real like, oh. Well, shit. you guys were like sitting around with, what like was there five in your class? There were five seven. Of there were six other. So companies, six other yeah. companies. Yeah. That, like, half of them were, like, you guys, and half of them were, like, we've been established for years. We yeah. just haven't figured out how to take off. Like, I mean, we were absolutely the baby, though. Yeah. Because yeah. oh, the other small ones were still, like, yeah, we've got, like, five million in funding. We were, like, mm, yeah, same, bro. <laughs> we're um, nationwide. We're, like, sick. I think, like, when it hit me also that we were, I think we have our heads down, like, working all the time, and it's really hard to, acknowledge, like, to see those things especially when you're just like on a grind and there's no there's not much like outside validation was when we had our in-person meeting with Hamdi and he said that he just had to have us in the incubator because he saw snow monkey as the Chobani equivalent to ice cream Mm -hmm. and that he really he was like I just have this feeling and I see it and I know that you guys are going to like change the category um that was I'll, like, literally never forget that moment. And I was like, okay, if Hamdi sees something, too, like, we're not that shit crazy. Yeah. I think for me, I've, like, still, like, it still hits me every day that, like, we're doing this. And it's, like, I think the biggest aha moment for me is the girl that I went to middle school with who I haven't talked to since middle school who, like, follows me on Instagram, like, found Snow Monkey in her local grocery store in Colorado and, like, tagged me on Instagram. And, like, that to me is, like, oh, like, wow, like, we're actually doing it. You know what I mean? Like, little moments like that every day are like, oh, shit, like, we have a company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, the big moments, too, of, like, getting accepted in the incubator and being around other really cool entrepreneurs, like, yes, that's super validating. Um, But just the little things, like, wow, my friends can go to my hometown and, like, pick up some Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we went on a tangent after, like, all of 2017, but I guess to quickly get everyone up to speed, because we're almost at the end of 2019 now, uh, was 2018, we just focused on growing distribution. We went from that, like, 250 to 1,200 stores, which was insane. We launched three new flavors. We launched matcha, passion fruit, and cinnamon um, because we just needed to get Snow Monkey out there so that, because we were getting so many requests and just really, like, serving our consumers. So that's really all we focused on. Ruby and I were flying nonstop, Still flying nonstop. <laughs> but more yeah. last year. Yeah. Like, we had some crazy road trips. Uh, what are plane trips called when they're road trips? Same. Yeah, you're yeah. on a road show. Okay. Um, but yeah, like that, also not to say like that year came with a lot of growing pains too. I think it, we had a lot of learnings. Um, I was maybe definitely selling air for a while. That did happen. Yeah, definitely some production growing pains where yeah. on those road shows there was no actual product to sell anybody, but they came back with orders yeah. and we figured yeah. out how to fill those I orders. I mean, we had the product. It's just if something doesn't pass all of the third-party testing, we we don't sell that. I mean, never. Uh, we're never going to play it, yeah. well, play it, it dicey even... with health. No. For sure. And like it never even like really got to that point. It was more like they sent us the wrong size lids for our packaging. So then we start our production run and the matcha lid started yeah. flying off the pints <laughs> and we get a call from our, from our co-packer and they're like, uh, these don't fit. And, and like, your Rachel matcha and I had just finished floor. like probably the biggest meeting of our lives. Yeah. And we get the call. We're like, yes, we got the PO. We're ready to go. And while we're in the meeting, the co-packer calls and it's like, yeah, the matcha lids don't fit. And so me and Rachel are like, we just sold matcha. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, and that was a cool one. Not really a good product to sell topless, so. <laughs> yeah, no. Is there a good product to sell topless? Mm. Maybe not in our industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, moving on. Um, so, that was 2018. I, I think we could probably do, like, a whole episode on various growing pains and how we yeah. got out of those situations. And I think I think that's something really important to talk about, too, with a company is a lot of people, I call it founder PTSD, is that, like, everyone starts at, like, making $10 million in revenue, and you're like, okay, but, like, how did you get to that $10 million? Like, it was not smooth sailing. There's no way. Yeah. But all of a sudden, they're like, yeah, I was making $10 million. It was so difficult. We had no money. We had no budget. And we're like, <laughs> but pardon, <how? laughs> pardon me? Like, that's not true. Um, so maybe we do another episode on that. But for the sake of time, we kind of powered through 2018. 
made it out alive with three new children, passion fruit, matcha, a clo- fully clothed matcha, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and cinnamon. Then we get into 2019, and... I feel like it's just been a blur. It's been a blur. I yeah. think... I mean, 2019, to- we really focused on elevating brand awareness and um, making sure that now that we were in all these stores, people knew that they could go get their monkey there and start, like moving pints and with all the like elevated brand awareness with Liza and Mel like just really killing it on that awareness scale that's when we started just being so like flattered but also surprised by the volume of inbound requests we had where people were like hey we want to see more behind the scenes like we love what you're doing like how did you do that like oh I love Ruby's like shoes and just like realizing (laughs) that like because Ruby's resident hype beast but just realizing that people cared so much about the why and the how. Like, yes, we make a dope, healthy product, but the fact that we're, like, five women under 30, like, trying to take on and revolutionize this really old and traditional industry is pretty dope. And we were like, okay, let, let's share it if that's what the people want to hear. Yeah, give the people what they want, yeah. right? And then we also totally skipped over, um, we also did a rebrand in 2019, which oh, yeah. Yeah. maybe another thing we do a whole episode on, because that was a yes. lot, but um, really like edited our packaging, came up with a new product descriptor for Snow Monkey before we, it started out as Sub-Zero Superfood, then it became Superfood Ice Treat, Superfood Ice yeah. Treat, then was there anything in between? No. We almost did something in between, but then we never did, and then... Um, Quick pivots, benefits of startup. And then um, we landed for this, for our final rebrand that we did this year now, we're um, a dairy-free anytime dessert because you can have Snow Monkey anytime you want, and it's also dairy-free, so pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. Well, and we, then, skipped, we skipped the timeline because technically I wasn't here at the beginning of 2019. Yeah, we also yeah. forgot to say when we stole Mel from Chirvani. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, Chirvani, but thank you for... First off, giving Everything. us a grant, <laughs> opening up your entire company to us, and then letting us steal your employee. Um, shout out to them for this. But yeah, so yeah. in just before summer, Rachel and I sat down, and I was just like, holy shit, man, I need help. At that point, I was doing, obviously, Rachel and Ruby really, really helped me with marketing and stuff, but it just kind of hit that point. And I also, also a huge call out to like all of the external partners that we have. We have an amazing op gu- ops guy, Justin, that we talked about in our last podcast. We have um, amazing digital marketers that we work with from an agency, um, a graphic design guy who helped us with the rebrand, Pierce, yeah. who's awesome, um, killer merchandisers, um, killer brokers, sales teams, like, who else am I forgetting? Well, like, I a like killer a tribe, office. like, yeah. our fans yeah. who are like, I went to my local Whole Foods, I went to Sprouts, and I was like hey, you need to carry Snow Monkey. This is a great product. I order it online. Like, ones who are telling us, like, you guys are crushing it, like, wanting to write about us for, like, their school papers or podcasts. Mm-hmm. Like, all that stuff, it matters, that word of mouth. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. we just had this awesome community of people helping us, but we said, all right, we need some internal internal support. So that's where we put out the job description for marketing manager, and then Mel DM'd Rachel. Yeah, it was... It was <laughs> Okay, mind you, I was in New Orleans celebrating Jazz Fest because New Orleans is my soul city. Shout out to New Orleans. Um, But also, it was like midnight my time, and I was in like a half probably drunken stage just scrolling through Instagram and saw Rachel's story first before I saw the Snow Monkey story. I think I saw half the Snow Monkey story and like came back to it later. But DM'd Rachel on the side, and I was like, but wait, we should talk. And, like, that's all I said. And then I was like, we should talk. Like, we put up job (laughs) postings for executive assistant and full-time marketing manager. And at that point, Mel was doing a lot of, like, hands-on food work. So my background, just sidestep, is I went to culinary school. I have a hospitality business management degree, like, all that good jazz. Um, and I had been working with Giovanni and what the Snow Monkey team has seen me do is I was a chef. I was always in the kitchen whenever they saw me, um, but my title was definitely events chef. So huge piece of my job was field marketing. And that is a little known fact for most people that interact with me in my, when, yeah. when I was in yeah. my role. 
We had no so, idea. Yeah, we, we thought didn't you were Chef Mel. We were like, yo, Chef Mel wants to work for us. Like, sick. But, but, but like, like, we don't have a job. We, we can't afford a full-time <laughs> chef. Yeah. Like, we love you. Uh, but then we talked, and Mel, we put up, we did, like, an assessment. We gave all the candidates an assessment, and Mel totally crushed it. And we're like, fuck, like, yeah, sorry for I my did. French, but we're like, yo, Chef Mel knows what a mark is. <laughs> yeah. I did that assessment on the or while I was at one of my biggest trade shows that I was running in my hotel room at like 2 a.m. after we had our team dinner and then rolled out of bed at like 7 a.m. the following morning to and go run a show. she crushed it. Oh, yeah. She crushed it. And we were totally like, crushed. we need her. Yeah, we're like, come here. So <laughs> stole her. It worked and out. yeah, here we are. Um, we also okay. went a little over because obviously we're going like at a thousand miles per hour that we cannot keep our days or years straight but it was definitely important to lay it all out there that entrepreneur P- ptsd is i think real. the uh, the post the the show notes need to have an actual bullet point timeline for everything like, because <laughs> what really happened no i mean paraphrasing because we like that's true yeah we gave in and out yeah but i think that's like a pretty good representation of what it's like to have done this for how many years have we been doing three? this three 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 years i mean kickstarter was 2016 yeah, so, yeah, BU was four years ago. We were in business. We were, like, doing that content shoot where we wore a pumpkin oh, onesie. God. That has to be dug up. <laughs> we did this, like, because we obviously didn't have a product, so we were trying to create content to, like, make the Snow Monkey social media pages relevant. <laughs> so we did, like, a Halloween workout, and somehow I got put into a cat costume, and Rachel got put into a pumpkin onesie, and we were doing, like, these weird workout routines. It's embarrassing. I'm, like, but... on a... Airdyne assault bike in the costume we're doing pull-ups like we did it in my building too and all of my like apartment mates what do you call those people that live in your building neighbors (laughs) (laughs) killing it um (laughs) or like walking into the gym staring at us and then just turning right around because Because Liza's full on cat whiskers on her face yeah yeah good times but I also think this the way we told the story is very indicative of just like our relationship too it's very like we're very much intertwined, um, and because we're all friends before this too, I think that says a lot about like how we run the company. Um, mm-hmm. It's very fluid, very much like, you know, if you need help on something that I'm not an expert in, but I can lend a hand, I'll do it. Well, Liza and I convinced you guys to do a podcast, so like, there's that. True. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So here we are, interwebs. Yeah, here we are doing it. So now you guys are all brought up to speed. So this is where it the is, fun begins. It is October that we're recording this in October of 2019 and uh, yeah. moving moving forward. Yeah. Big strides. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, All right. Captain's log is done. Yeah. We will sign off for today, but stay tuned for the next, next episode. See you soon. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Eat Snow Monkey. Monkey Business is brought to you by the Snow Monkey Kingdom and produced by Autopodologus. Our theme song is brought to you by Alex English.